uh, a bit of a PowerPoint presentation at the start, um, which if you're like me, um, is not an enjoyable experience. Uh, it gives people the opportunity to uh, perhaps uh, talk amongst each other or ask questions. Um, but uh, at the end, there will be a demonstration of uh, one of the technologies and probably our most critical technology um, product that we sell, uh, which is around data replication. Um, so if you've been on to the Attunity website um, and done some digging or if you've heard of us, you'll be aware that um, the, the core product, what we're really known for is, um, is data replication. And the tool we sell is called Replicate, so uh, the clue is in the name for that. Uh, but also recently we've extended that functionality um, to really enable um, businesses to get a lot more value out of their data and realize that value a lot quicker uh, by a, a product that we've had probably for the past two years now called Compose. And um, what we've done is we've augmented that, we've enhanced that product so that uh, we now have it as a separate product called Compose for Data Lakes. And I'll talk about that uh, towards the end when I'm giving the demonstration. Um, and it, it may well be something you, you might want to come back to us and say, actually, we, we do want to see a demonstration on Compose for, for data lakes because we've got some use cases that that might uh, be useful for. But let's just make sure um, what we are dealing with is relevant to you and you're also having similar discussions and you're seeing similar use cases. Um, so with that, let's take a, uh, a step through. So uh, Gartner, everyone's aware of Gartner and um, how widely uh, respected they are by vendors and also the customers. Um, you know, we get contacted purely because uh, we're on a Gartner list in the Challenger quadrant uh, for data integration. Um, so we don't typically uh, sell ourselves really as a, a data integration uh, company. If you look at some of the other players in that market, in that segment, you'll see companies like, um, you know, IBM, you see the... Um, Talons, you see Informatica, you see uh, the uh, other ETL specific toolings around that space and that's generally not what we do. Um, we, we're really about data replication. We make that really, really nice and simple. But the main reason, um, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of traction at the moment is the two top um, issues that are facing CIOs and organizations at the moment. Uh, and I suspect what's actually creeped up this list um, significantly in the past uh, six to ten months has been security. Um, we may well see security uh, being a very dominant um, emerging investment priority uh, for the CIOs uh, over the next year or so. But I think, uh, as well as that, we're still going to see a big focus around um, being able to use the data, whether that's in uh, BI, business information, or whether that's around analytics, um, pure reporting purposes, or maybe even uh, being able to leverage analytics into an AI environment. Um, so we do see a lot of big data adoption in that space. People want all the data from all, you know, as many systems as they can get into one place. So the best uh, repository for that um, is uh, the, the big data Hadoop environments. Um, so that's where we see an enormous amount of business and uh, a lot of activity. The second option, the, you know, the, the more cost-effective, easily easier to manage, lower total cost of ownership, all those sorts of things, is the cloud. Uh, and again, um, you know, the likes of um, Microsoft and AWS have had a, a, you know, a dominant footprint in the cloud environment for a number of years, uh, and are now probably leading the way with offering a big data in the cloud environment as the world or Hadoop in the cloud. Um, so AWS, very strong footprint there. Um, Microsoft really coming up very strongly in second place from virtually nowhere in the past 18 months with their Azure uh, stack. So again, we're seeing a lot of in, uh, integration activity or replication activity about getting data into the cloud. Um, 
and typically that has been something that could have been difficult to do. Uh, but again, we, we make that nice and straightforward. Just a bit of background about myself. Um, Prior to working with Attunity, I worked for a company called Talent, um, which is a uh, open source uh, ETL, big data, master data management, data quality, SOA uh, type tool set. Um, so my background has been in data integration, data management, master data management for the past uh, 10 or 12 years. Um, so Attunity by far is, you know, Probably the easiest tool set I've come across to work with in, in being able to deliver these two, two top uh, use cases for the CIOs. So a bit about Attunity, um, how we regarded, we're not very well known, um, which is slowly changing. You know, we're starting to see more activity. But uh, when I first joined, um, you know, we, we did spend the first 20 minutes of meetings kind of uh, explaining who we are and where we've come from. Um, that's getting a little easier now because the real-time uh, efficiencies that we're delivering is, is becoming more and more demanded and uh, our search engine optimization is getting better. So when people look for real-time integration uh, or CDC, Attunity comes up uh, very, you know, very much at the top of the search list. But um, we've got more than 2,000 customers globally. Um, there is a typo in the second square, 44 of the Fortune 500 isn't very much, that should read 44 of the Fortune 100. So out of the top 100 companies in the world, 44 of them are active Attunity customers and have invested with us. And as I mentioned earlier, we are a challenger in the Gartner Data Integration Magic Quadrant. So you just have to sit somewhere on Gartner and, and you immediately gain a lot of visibility and a certain amount of credibility as well. Um, but we, or certainly I don't feel that's the best magic quadrant for us because we sit with a lot of other companies that do, you know, more traditional ETL uh, type tooling. So m eventually maybe there'll be one for CDC, um, but until then we're, we're happy to sit as a challenger in that, uh, in that quadrant. And also, we have some extremely uh, strategic um, partnerships. So Microsoft embed our technology in Microsoft SQL Server. So over the past few years, uh, you will have seen, if anyone's worked with Microsoft, um, a CDC option in Microsoft. That's actually uh, our technology underneath that. And as of uh, a month or two ago, we entered a, um, a really very strategic, very big um, OEM agreement with Microsoft where they're actually embedding the full product into their uh, SQL Server stack to allow migration. So uh, people or customers that buy Microsoft SQL Server Enterprise Edition uh, have an option to take a 12-month uh, free-to-use license uh, to use Replicate uh, within the SQL Server environment so they can migrate away from Oracle. Uh, it might be IBM DB2. It, it could be any number of uh, the supported endpoints that we have as sources if they want to put uh, their um, the data sets into the Microsoft stack or into the uh, Azure cloud environment. Again, Teradata, uh, there's no OEM agreement there, so we have uh, technology that shifts data into the Teradata environment, um, and they're a, a reseller uh, for us as well. Hortonworks is a technology partner for us. Um, we work very closely with their uh, sales account managers here in EMEA um, and in the UK, uh, working very closely on, on solving problems. Um, you know, what Hortonworks can do today in the stack is, uh, is, is actually quite a lot, and the, the more recent release of Hortonworks 2.6 and above, uh, giving the uh, option for ACID compliance means that we can actually now deliver data in what we like to call an analytics ready state in the Hadoop cluster. And uh, we think that's very much a, a big change in the rate of adoption for uh, Hadoop. Uh, AWS, AWS have, uh, have again been a strong partner for us for a number of years and actually embed the Attunity Replicate uh, product and have renamed it as uh, Amazon's um, 
DMS, Data Migration Service. So if you've ever looked at Amazon DMS or if you've heard of it, that's actually Replicate in the cloud uh, using AWS. Uh, and there are other uh, strong alliances as well, such as um, Hewlett Packard and uh, Oracle actually um, white label some of our technology for their own replication product, as well as IBM. They re uh, embed our replication technology for their own products as well. Um, so we, we do deliver a lot through our uh, partners and, uh, and our competitors. So what do we call, or what do we mean by modern data integration? What is that? Um, really, I think the difference that's emerging today is it's more about um, near real-time data movement. Traditionally, in the past, it's always been a very batch-centric process. So it's now about we or the, our customers saying, we want to see what's going on in the business at a, at a point in time during the business day. Um, up until a few years ago, being able to see what you've done up until the previous business day was enough. Uh, that's now not cutting it when the businesses are now focusing on customer interaction, on delivering value to the customers. You know, the, the batch processing was fine for the back office analytics, but where are we actually interacting with our front of the business? when we deal with our customers, when we're looking at our supply chain, when we're looking at our inventories, when we're doing um, interactions with our customer accounts, when we're uh, a payment company and we, we want to understand um, if this uh, transaction looks fraudulent or not, you know, we, we can't wait until the end of the day to, uh, to see that and make that decision. We need to do it pretty much as soon as it's happening. So. You know, we try to make data, or we don't try, we do make data available uh, and ready for analytics um, across multiple platforms. So uh, again, towards the end, there's a demo, and I'll have a look at um, the technologies that we support. We do very much support and play in the structured world. So relational databases, yes. Um, CSV files, yes. Um, JSON files, yes. Um, you know, if it's structured data, we can deal with it. If someone says, well, actually, what about Twitter feeds? What about Facebook updates? You know, I've got other APIs, you know, service oriented architecture, business events. Do we deal with those? No, we don't. There are other tools out there that do deal with those and deal with them very, very well. Um, we deal with what those tools don't do very well, and that is uh, relational databases feeding their changes out in a near real-time scenario. Um, and how do we do that? Well, it's really down to reading their transaction logs. The relational databases today uh, have had for a long time a transaction log to support uh, being able to roll back. If a uh, connection for a transaction is lost, it will roll back the data. Um, if uh, someone aborts an operation, if they cancel out of an operation, any data that it had prepared for update gets rolled back. And in order for a database to roll back, it records the changes, it records inserts, it records possible deletes in the transaction logs. And that's what we read. So we don't go into the tables. We don't lock tables. And that's an important difference for us because ETL tools and scoop, if you're taking data from source, and you're doing a snapshot, in order to achieve that, you're actually locking the source tables. You're going directly to operational databases, you're looking at tables, you're locking them, and then you're copying them across. So you're either interrupting the business during the time of day, or you're looking for a window of opportunity uh, or a time gap overnight or on a weekend to be able to achieve that. And because we don't do that, you can actually start replication during the business day. We don't interrupt the operation of the source systems, of your ERP system, of your SAP system, of your Oracle financials. You know, those systems still happily uh, carry on because we're looking at the change logs to pick up any changes. Why are we different? So we are different. There are other CDC tools on the market, Oracle Golden Gate, the predominant uh, player. Um, very much supports Oracle. Uh, they 
do do some support of uh, SQL, uh, but as of uh, SQL Server 2016, there is no relationship, um, and therefore there's no license agreement that allows Oracle to interact with a SQL Server uh, for doing change data capture. Um, and again, uh, they have some technology for DB2. We've never seen them in the DB2 arena. So Oracle do Oracle CDC really, really well. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, there are other competitors, such as Strim, such as HVR. Uh, but typically, what they demand or what they need is client installation on the source and targets. And that's another differentiator for us in that uh, we are not putting any client, any software installation or any agent or code on the source systems uh, and on the targets. So we can read directly without interfering uh, with any of the infrastructure setups for those. So that helped us win a major deal at a bank uh, last year where they had 1,800 plus Oracle instances globally and they wanted to ingest data from those uh, Oracle instances in near real time so that they could do um, fraud uh, analysis across those databases. And as soon as some of the competitors said, yep, we, we will need to put uh, an agent or a client on each of those, that's 1,800 clients, their DBAs went no. No, as soon as there's an update, as soon as there's a patch issued, or if we need to do those, the regression testing um, was, was just a non-starter for them. So architecturally, we're nice and simple. We, we are an installation on a Linux server or on a Windows server, and that's it. Um, and we're nice and easy to use. There's no uh, IDE, there's no Eclipse to install. It's uh, access through a web browser, and again, the, the uh, range of support for source and target systems is, is very, very broad. And because it's um, housed in or accessed through a web browser, it's really easy to use. Um, there's no code. Um, so therefore, uh, we like to think of it as, uh, as being very agile. What people would take a week to do in, for instance, uh, Golden Gate uh, can be done within a day using um, using Replicate, using our products. So customers like the agility, customers like the ease of use, and customers and their DBAs are very much like the fact that we don't intrude on their systems. So there's, a, you know, you could call it a zero footprint architecture. We're not really um, intruding on those systems. So there's been a shift towards this modern data architecture, and what does that mean? Um, so traditional layer is across the bottom there, and the modern architecture is across the top. So where we saw data warehouses, where we saw uh, businesses with Natiza, with Teradata, with large IBM DB2 instances, you know, we're now seeing a shift towards the data lake. Uh, Hadoop is being put in place. Um, so that's a more modern place. Data warehouses were great at storing, again, structured data. Data lakes are great at storing everything. Um, batch processing, again, you're, you're confining the uh, times and your ability to look at relevant data and timely data to a batch window. Well, now with CDC, you can stream your data. You can get a continuous near real-time feed from your operational systems to the desired target. Uh, and when I'm talking about near real-time, I'm really talking within a second uh, or within a few seconds. You know, I've, I've not, personally, I've not seen anything that, that really goes over two or three seconds from getting data from a source system to, to the desired target. Um, and, you know, again, as I'm sure you're seeing, you're seeing this uh, shift from on-premise to the cloud. Um, and again, we'll, we'll cover each of these and how we do that through replication. So the evolution of data analytics, what does that mean? If we think about the slide we just saw, um, we're talking about operationalizing the data lake. How do we populate the data lake? How do we get data into it? How do we make it available so that people can start using it with these new tools, these new dashboards that make it really nice to look at and to understand and clarify the presentation of data? So the Tableau, the clicks are the tools, the Power BI. These are the tools that, that um, uh, you know, customers want to use. 
because they make uh, analysis nice and easy. They can carve up the data. They can present the data in a way that suits them or suits the business. Um, but they still need to draw from a single place. They don't want to have to tap into multiple different uh, places in order to get the enterprise data. Real-time and streaming, um, how is that being managed? Uh, well, really, that's Kafka. Uh, we'll we'll uh, have a look at how we interact with Kafka. And Hadoop and the cloud, uh, again, uh, we'll have a, a, a discussion and a, a look at that as well. So operationalizing the data lake is the first one we're going to be looking at. And so businesses, and I'm certain certain to think that the likes of Hortonworks, Cloudera, Mapar are saying Hadoop has won the battle. Um, I, I think they've got the upper hand, uh, but I still think the battle is, uh, is still being fought. Um, so why do they think they've won? because it's moved out of development and test. People are now using Hadoop in their production environments. Um, but as that uh, has been won, uh, we're now seeing businesses are demanding more. You know, I want more data in there. I want you to get it from more obscure sources, and I need it to be closer to the production time. You know, I want to understand what the impact is to changes in the business now, not in 24 hours. Uh, if we do something that uh, eventually impacts a customer, I don't want to wait until a customer complains. I don't want to wait until we lose customers. I want to be able to see that impact very, very soon. Scoop was the traditional way uh, and is a way that um, businesses still do use to acquire data from your more difficult systems, uh, relational databases into Hadoop. So things like Flume are great for feeding logs into um, into Hadoop. Uh, so if you're looking at um, web logs, for instance, Flume is a, is a great open source tool for uh, feeding in that data into the Hadoop environment. Um, if we look at um, Twitter feeds and Facebook updates where uh, customer services may be um, looking at the way they interact with their customers, service oriented architecture, the likes of MuleSoft and Talent can manage those um, really, really well. You know, the, the problem is, and always has been, dealing with the relational databases, dealing with the underlying sources on all these production systems. My ERP system is SAP. I want all that data into my data lake. That's really hard. Um, so Scoop was being used, but again, as we discussed, it has its own uh, difficulties and its own um, challenges in terms of being able to know when and where to use Scoop. So uh, we have a use case with the financial services. Um, again, this is what I spoke about earlier. This customer is actually HSBC. Uh, so HSBC globally have adopted Replicate for streaming data in near real time from Oracle and DB2. Uh, what they're moving towards has been a, um, a classic data lake. So it is Hadoop, it's Hortonworks, and it is petabytes and petabytes of data um, that we're feeding in. The next uh, option that they're taking a move towards is also streaming data in through Kafka. Um, and we're also working with them as well about um, making the data analytics ready on their data lake. Um, it's a classic situation. I'm sure you've come across it whereby, uh, yes, you know, we can deal with um, CDC data. When it's 10 or 20 or 30 tables, we can manually develop scripts that, that make that data coherent, that do the joins and the merge and the materialization. But actually, when you start dealing with thousands of tables and tens of thousands of tables that these sorts of organizations have, that suddenly doesn't scale. Um, so we have the tooling to be able to automate the, uh, the CDC data into a single record on the Hadoop structures now. And it, why were they doing this? It's the 360 degree view of the customer. It's all about customer engagement. And again, as we spoke about, or I mentioned earlier, it is also around um, fraud analytics as well. So the evolution of Hadoop, where else are we seeing activity, real time and streaming? Um, before I go into that, you know, what's what I made a statement earlier where I said, you know, I think the battle for Hadoop is still being fought. And there's been a new player into the cloud market recently, which I think could be an incredible disrupting element for Hadoop. That business is called Snowflake, and 
they can spin up uh, a very large uh, cloud environment on AWS uh, and Azure and uh, enable some, uh, some very fast processing of data and then you can turn it off again very, very quickly. Their, their ability to be agile, to be able to take vast amounts of data, to process it very, very quickly and deliver answers back to the business is very quick. And I, I can see Snowflake actually being, um, you know, a disruptive force. The reason I say that is because the limitation of Hadoop, something that, that we have um, only just... Um, you know, manage to get our arms around and, and solve the problem of is that when you put change data into a data lake, um, because of the, uh, well, for Cloudera, it's, it's, it's still an issue. Hortonworks have just brought in the asset compliance. On Hadoop, you couldn't do updates. It's an append-only data store, so you're just writing and writing. If, if a customer changes their address, changes their contacts details, um, it's not an update. It's a whole new record. And if all, the, all you're capturing out of your uh, change is just the email change, how do you know which record to change? How do you know which customer it applies to? How do you know which field needs to be updated? All those questions is, uh, is what we've been able to uh, address and make uh, a lot easier with Hadoop. Um, so I think Hadoop um, was stalling in its rate of adoption there because businesses suddenly began to realize that doing the updates, getting the most relevant view of data out of Hadoop uh, was an expensive task. Uh, and now we're, we're bringing the cost of that down. But let's have a look at real time and streaming. Um, you know, we're talking about Kafka with that. So that's Confluent. Um, in uh, Microsoft Azure, they have event hubs, and if we talk about Google, there's also uh, PubSub in Google, so everyone has kind of got their own flavor. It's Kinesis in AWS, but everyone's got their own flavor of streaming data. And what does that mean? It's real-time processing. It's the ability to have real-time monitoring, and it can be real-time data into Hadoop if they're deciding to take from Kafka, consume that data, and put it into Hive or HBase or whatever storage uh, on Hadoop that they choose to um, uh, ultimately put the data as a, as a target. Um, so it suits uh, the businesses exploring the um, Hadoop environment because it's big and fast data. And it scales. Um, it scales really, really nicely. It's a nice, simple architecture, um, and it's um, very, very robust. Um, and it gives them, hopefully, actionable insight. So we have an, on uh, an online retail case um, with one of our customers. This is Experian, the, travel, the online travel booking company. Um, so again, they've adopted Replicate uh, to feed changes, to feed um, uh, online activity from their databases that support their online portal um, to Kafka. So if someone is booking a holiday, they're booking flights, something goes wrong with that, a reservation doesn't complete properly, when they do their uh, fill in their credit card details, if there's a failure at that point, people just tend to go, ah, okay, I'll come back to it later, and they don't. Um, so that was a, a real issue around customer churn or losing customers that they wanted to address. By using Kafka, they now have a response uh, within under 20 seconds. An actual person in their customer service center gets an alert about the transaction that failed, who the customer was, what the customer um, contact details are, and they get in touch with them immediately so that they can successfully process the transaction. So their rate of um, you know not losing customers, of customer success, um, has gone up considerably and they have a, a much happier client base as well. So that's uh, one use case of Kafka. We have another here in the UK um, with a large global payment gateway company um, where in a similar vein, they're using Kafka to build up um, a portfolio and a profile of all the customers that they use. What they had done is because they're a payment gateway, Previously, they were going out to the likes of Experian or to um, uh, Equifax and getting a credit uh, check done for all their customers. Even if these customers 
use the same card day after day, time after time, every time they were using a credit check. So what they've done, they're using Spark and they're using Hive to build up a very large in-memory capability to say, yes, here comes a new transaction. I've seen that credit card before and it fits their pattern of behavior. They're buying another cup of coffee from Starbucks. Yes, they do that a lot. Um, you know, we're happy with that. We've never seen any transaction denials in the past, so I'm going to save myself 20, 30p pence um, or a few cents in euros by not doing a credit check, by storing this information and building up my own profile about this customer and their behavior. So that if I suddenly see later in the day that they're trying to buy a laptop in Nigeria, you know what, I don't have to make a connection out to Experian to figure out that that could possibly be a fraudulent action. Um, so the ability to manage potential fraud, fraudulent transactions is a lot quicker um, and it's cheaper. So they're saving money as well as being um, a lot more uh, agile in how they're responding to their own customers as well. And finally, looking at Hadoop and the cloud. Uh, and this is uh, where we can look at the way we can use Replicate um, across uh, or in the hybrid type of environment where we have on-premise and we also have data that we want to put to the cloud. So Replicate has the unique capability um, of being able to talk to itself or to other Replicate servers in a compressed and secure fashion. So when these two instances of Hadoop, uh, sorry, not Hadoop, of Replicate on-premise and on in the cloud talk to each other, um, the data is compressed and it is encrypted through an AES 256-bit encryption. So due to the compression and due to the rate of transactions we can package into a compressed file, um, the latency is quite low. We can put a large number of transactions in, send it to the remote replicate server, which may then write it to Hadoop or to a cloud-based data warehouse, uh, such as Redshift, such as Snowflake, and the latency for that will be um, minimal. Um, you, you have to really be looking at, you know, a sub-second latency to, to for it to be observable. Um, but the beauty of that is it makes hybrid data replication very, very simple. Um, it's the same tooling. It's the There's no commercial cost. The way Replicate is uh, commercially structured is this is where we get our money. We look at your sources. We don't care where you're putting the data to. I don't care if Hadoop has got, um, you know, 3,000 nodes and it has, uh, you know, 300 petabytes of storage, that's fine. Uh, we ignore the targets and you can have one, two, 20 or 30 replicate servers. We don't license by the number of replicate servers. What we look at is the number of cores on the source. So that's where the value is for us. Um, what you do with it once you get it into replicate is up to you. So the, the ability to scale out uh, your use cases is it is uh, what I could only describe as economically scalable. <laughs> um, whether you've got the infrastructure to support it, um, the data to support it, the servers to support it, the memory, that technical uh, scalability is, is one thing. There's a cost associated with that. But um, in terms of your commercial license with uh, Replicate, um, you shouldn't really see any real change if you need to um, propagate more Replicate servers to support your uh, end need. Okay, so the use case we have around this, um, we call it a Fortune 100 automotive maker. The actual customer is called Ford. So the Ford Motor Company um, have four and a half application servers. Um, if you see in the, the bottom left-hand square there, that's just the relational sources. So that's DB2 on a mainframe. Um, it's SQL Server and it's Oracle databases. Uh, they have four and a half thousand of those spread across the globe. So they have uh, manufacturing facilities in the US, in Asia Pacific, and in EMEA. Uh, they have dealers, they have uh, workshops, uh, you know, as we know, spread across the globe. And they all feed information into these four and a half thousand applications. And they're also making a huge drive, Ford is making a huge drive towards becoming the most connected car company in the world. Um, and we're playing a, a, a 
pretty pivotal role in that as we're, we're the backbone of really shifting all this data up into the cloud for them. So the, the cloud for them, it's a dupe in AWS and it's all about scale. Uh, they've got a massive AWS cluster um, housing Hadoop and uh, they just didn't want to take the uh, not only the complexity but the cost and the responsibility of you know uh, maintaining the SLA maintaining the uptime uh, the, as you know the beauty of AWS is it can automate that uh, on, a, on a vast scale uh, so their time to be able to deliver that was significantly reduced the amount of skills and labor they had to put in place to do that um, was minimal um, and it's giving them a competitive advantage as far as they're concerned in terms of what they can now do with their cars and the uh, predictive analytics around maintenance cycles, maintenance routines, part failure, um, are there common aspects to part failure in extreme cold, do we need to go back to the manufacturer you know, with more evidence and more information around part failure and those sorts of things. So, you know, it, it's not just the case of uh, them knowing where the car is and what it's doing and how many miles it's doing. It really gets down to, you know, being able to improve the product life cycle going forward uh, by understanding where the cars are operating, what conditions are they in, where do they fail, where do they perform well, uh, and improving that in their products going forward. So this we've covered off operationalizing Hadoop, we've looked at real-time streaming, so we've looked at HSBC as the bank um, that uh, you know we really helped them out by not being intrusive on their 1800 plus Oracle sources. We've helped Experian keep and retain uh, customers by being, for them to be able to be more proactive in reaching out to their customers and the global data lake for Ford. Um, that truly is an immense global data lake um, and uh, it's, it's delivering uh, great insights for them. So there are some other customer use cases I just wanted to go through briefly. Zurich Insurance is a very large customer of ours, um, so naturally they're headquartered in Zurich. Um, it's all around insurance, so again, it's a very regulated, highly audited environment, um, and they service, you know, the individuals, small businesses, um, and you know, of course, very large businesses as well by uh, providing indemnity insurance. So their uh, use case was around the customer. Um, you know, and they, they have this thing around seeing people, not policy. So it's a common theme amongst a lot of businesses is to interact with customers as an individual, not as, you know, uh, someone that is a common occurrence. So they have this, a uh, lot of data sharing around the employee information, um, where they get, um, you know, they can replicate data out so that as an employee, you can see how your retirement plan is uh, tracking. Um, so it's the really the yes I have a customer yes he has these policies what is inside that policy it has these funds what's the performance of those funds who's managing those funds how can I present that information to the customer it, it's all around it is the classical 360 degree view of data so they're getting information from Salesforce they're getting information from their employee interactions. They're getting information from fund management systems. It may not be their own funds. It could come from Fidelity. It could come from HSBC or other banks. Um, but blending all that information together gives the customer a very good view on themselves, uh, as well as the business then have one place to get all the information about their, uh, their customer. So it's that classic 360 degree view. Very briefly, how did they go around that? It was around really data acquisition. Probably, you know, one of the more difficult things in terms of being able to present data is is just acquiring the data in the first place. So uh, Replicate makes that nice and straightforward. Um, and there's levels of curation that they have. So who can see what about the data? So it's very regulated. Customer service personnel can perhaps see their name and address, but they may not be able to see account information. They can't see private contact information such as, you know, their email address, their telephone number, those sorts of things. So there's, it, it enables them to have different layers of protection and security until they get right up to the top where they have their presentation layer and they're using the same sorts of tools that all businesses are using to be able to look at the data. 
Um, but we are rippling through the changes. If someone makes a change to their policy, they uh, want to change the way their retirement fund is structured from very risky to lower risk things, uh, they can see those changes take place very quickly. Um, so the customer is happy, he's logging on the next day and he's seeing the changes happened. He's not seeing what was there last week, he's seeing what was there an hour or two ago. So the architecture, just briefly, um, the top part, the staging, the integration is something that sort of architecture has been around for a while. What is changing is the bottom part, the source to staging link. Um, you know, it is changing from uh, the batch processing, you know, typically DB2, vSAM, IMS systems, um, i-series, AS400s. They've been difficult systems to tap into to get real-time data out of. Um, you know, they are legacy systems with very different structures, uh, and we can enable that. We can get tap into those systems, and we can get real-time changes out of them. Uh, and then you've got your SQL, your Oracles, um, your Sybase, your MySQLs, your traditional RDBMS systems that have their standard transaction logs. Great, we can read those. And then, of course, they're also using SAP. SAP can be uh, a bit of a beast to deal with because they have their own uh, way of managing their data around having encrypt, not necessarily encrypted, but binary, their own binary format in these um, pool and clustered tables. So some of the data in SAP is clear text um, and some of it is not. Some of it is in a, an SAP specific binary format. Um, but we can translate all of that data out into clear text. You know, one of the complaints about SAP is that it's a, a vendor that's really um, managed the whole customer lock-in um, scenario very, very well. It's really difficult for businesses who want to move from SAP to something else to be able to do that. Um, whereas if we can come along and say, hey, that data that you've got in there, we can actually replicate that out, and it's not going to be another user license, it's, it's not going to be a huge cost to you because we're using a system license, they're really happy about that. So if you wanted to do analytics on SAP data, you had to buy an SAP tool to do that. Um, whereas if the business is going, yeah, but I want to use Tableau, we're using Click, we're using Power BI, these tools are cheap, everyone can use them, they're great. For SAP, no, uh, you, you've got to buy our tool. Well, that's no longer the case. Um, you can now replicate that data out into cheaper storage. It can go into Hadoop. It can go into your data lake. It can be fed out through Kafka, propagated into any cloud, any data lake environment you want, and you can use the tools that you want to be able to interrogate that data, again, in a near real-time fashion. Uh, so another use case we had, uh, this was a specialist insurance company in London. Um, and again, if, if we take what we just saw from um, uh, the Zurich architecture and we flip it on its side, uh, instead of going from top to bottom, we're going from left to right. And we, we see this all the time. There is a persistence. There is a processing layer in the middle. So Spark Streaming, Hadoop, um, they're all doing, uh, you know, some form of transformation with the data. They're doing aggregation of the data. Um, they're doing, you know, they're preparing it for an analysis. They're preparing it uh, by joining it with different sources, you know, but you want to use Spark because it gives you near real time. It gives you very, very fast processing. I can use Solar because it, it's a really rapid way to search and interrogate my data. And I want to use Hadoop uh, because it gives me a fantastic storage layer. But what I also want is I want that in near real time. And that's in this case, that's what the Kafka block is doing. In the ingest uh, block we're seeing in the second panel, we've got Apache Kafka sitting in there. For their external data, some of the things I talked about earlier, it's a specialist insurance company, so what they actually get a lot of is meteorological uh, information, not just from the Met Office in the UK, but from um, weather satellites, from third-party providers of weather information. They happen to insure a lot of boats, cargo boats. Um, so where these car uh, cargo boats are going, um, the, the risk that's applied to them according to where they're going and what they're carrying, uh, they change that day by day. 
and their policies change, or uh, depending on circumstances, their policy may be completely in, uh, negated because they're going into uh, the, off the coast of Somalia. They're going into waters that are known to be dangerous, or they're entering a weather pattern that is, you know, very high risk. So their ability to change and tailor quotes, combined with the data that they get from us from their typical. Um, you know, ODS operational systems, their uh, online transactional systems, you know, their typical policy management systems, their customer management systems. Um, combine that with the data that they're getting in through NIFI on uh, Horton Works, um, and they're able to really blend and look at that data for, for true risk analysis. So that's another use case. Okay, that's the end of the slides. Um, so. If everyone's still awake, um, does anyone have any questions before I uh, have a look at the demo? Uh, I would like to ask a technical question, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you, are, uh, you have told us uh, two interesting things. Uh, okay, more than two, but uh, I, I want to ask you about two. So uh, the first one, uh, you are reading uh, relational databases transaction logs. Mm -hmm. And the second one, you do it with a really low latency, sub-second latency. Yes. So, uh, and you don't install any client to the RDBMS host. So uh, the question is, do you rely on RDBMS ability to replicate transaction logs like data guard or database mirroring? No, we don't. So we actually directly read the logs. Um, so it, let's take uh, Oracle as an instance. Okay. We actually read the logs from LogMiner, and if they're not using LogMiner, we can actually read the binary logs um, that are stored perhaps on a file system or an ASM, if they're using a rack system. Mm -hmm. So the client software that we use, mm -hmm. typically for whether it's Oracle, SQL, um, MySQL, um, anything else, they they allow us to actually also consume data from the logs. So we we don't what we really take advantage of. What makes us perform well is the fact that we actually use the Oracle client to be able to um, to read that information. When it comes to SQL or a Microsoft SQL Server, we use the um, uh, the SQL client to be able to do that. So we leverage very much the technologies that these um, that these clients have okay. built into them. Um, you know, quite often they're, they're used just to purely read data from a table um, or to interrogate a table or, um, you know, I, I need to do a select statement from an application. I'll use an ODBC or a, a client to do that. But when you actually drill into them, they've got an enormous amount of functionality built into them, and that's what we're taking advantage of. Yeah. So, uh, and how do you manage to read, say, Oracle transaction log without installing a client to the or Oracle server? I mean, not through log miner. Yeah. In this case is clear, but what about file? So what we uh, do as part of the setup for Oracle, we actually also, um, there's a permissions, there's a group of permissions that need to be enabled for us to, for the user. So if we in replicate, when we set up an endpoint, which I'll show you, I'll show you um, it's very standard. It's the um, connection string, and then it's the port, and then it's the user that I'm connecting with. Now on Oracle, for that user, the replicate user, we ask it to have permissions and the credentials to have permissions to um, the transaction logs. And then we are just firing queries uh, into the uh, transaction log to be able to read that, and, and that's it. Um, when it comes to ASM, uh, if they're stored simply on a file system, we, we either read them, there's a couple of ways we can do it. We can read them on the file system, on the Oracle instance, or we can actually pick them up and um, put them in our own system on the Replicate server and read them locally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's it's pretty straightforward. I mean, Oracle haven't gone out of their way to to um, to make it difficult. Um, you know, they, they recognize that it, it, it helps people if, if they can be read. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and probably <clears throat> one more question uh, regarding uh, data consistency. Mm -hmm. So because reading transaction log means uh, we can read even data 
uh, and transact uh, and operations uh, which uh, still not uh, committed. So yeah, like open that transaction. Dirty. Yep. So if we take a dirty read of the transaction log, that's what we do not do. Um, we only read, or rather, we only replicate and commit to the target um, closed transactions. Um, and the reason, okay. we, yeah, the reason, part of the reason we do that is because we, we want to avoid the scenario where we're doing a dirty read. Um, the other reason is that if if our connection to your source Oracle instance goes down, or SQL, or whatever your source is we know what the last committed transaction was. So we, we didn't read something that was going to potentially change. We read something that we know was committed. Uh, so if we read transaction uh, 10898, and then when we go, you know, we commit that to our target, and when we go back for the next one, um, the Oracle instance is down. We know when it comes back online, we need to go back to 10898 and read the next one. So. There's two reasons. One is for transactional consistency, you're right, and the other is for uh, recovery from failure. Failure. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, so let me minimize PowerPoint. Uh, let me bring up uh, my replicate server. So uh, the demo I've got uh, can go to two targets. Um, I can do a replicate to Hadoop, or I can do replicate to Kafka. Um, who would like to? See, is is there a preference? Is there you, you guys are doing more with data lakes or more to Kafka? Who? What would you like to see? And if I've got time, I can do both. Mm, let's start with Kafka. Okay. Oakley, Oakley. So my Kafka broker is up and running. Uh, so I'm, I'm using uh, Hortonworks here. Um, it's nice and reliable, I find, uh, especially when I'm running a virtual machine on my 16 gig laptop. Um, it tends to consume a bit less memory than the uh, Cloudera one and performs quite well. So th it's um, not a personal preference. I'm saying we have to use uh, uh, Hortonworks. It, it just works a little better for my uh, demo environments. So Kafka, uh, to look at Kafka, um, I use a handy free tool just so that I don't have to go into a Unix command line and, and bring up a stream of messages as they're going through. Um, this Kafka tool allows me to uh, interrogate topics and brokers. And as you can see, I've got a connection to my Hortonworks cluster. And if I refresh my topics, uh, I've just got one topic there at the moment called Table Schemas, and we'll have a look at why I have that uh, in a few minutes. So this is uh, Replicate. So I just had a task open. But when you first log into Replicate, um, it's accessed through a web browser. So uh, I'm using Chrome in this instance. And here's my URL. It's uh, actually just a Tunity Replicate. So I get rid of all of that. Um, that and just hit enter. It takes me. Oh, brilliant! <laughs> That's not the desired response. Okay, let's do that again. Open it up. Replicate. Ah, oh, come along. The joys of a live demo. Replicate server is running. Demo hmm. effect. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's the gremlin in my demo machine. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's try again. Replicate. Your connection is on private. That's fine. Proceed. That's better. Okay. So. Uh, when you first land in a Trinity Replicate, um, you get uh, your task view. So there's uh, a couple of views. Uh, this is the task one. And then I can switch to my server view. So that's where I can manage uh, things around the server. So if I want to schedule things, if I want to um, put in notifications, if I want to do resource control, I'll touch on all those things later. Um, but uh, for now, we'll, we're going to have a look at how do we actually use this tool. So. Uh, when you first use it, um, this is empty. You know, obviously, it doesn't come with any pre-configured task. And what we need to do is actually uh, build endpoints. So we have a button across our top menu here called Manage Endpoint Connections. 
uh, as you can see, I've got a, a number of connections already built up. I can look at uh, my sources and see that I've got some file and some typical uh, databases as sources, as well as an iSeries. And then for my targets, um, I've got things like uh, an AWS instance of SQL. Uh, there's uh, Hortonworks, there's Cloudera, there's Mapar, there's JSON, there's Kafka, uh, and there's other relational databases as well. But if I want to create a new one, um, I just go to my new endpoint connection, click on that, and uh, give it a uh, name. Call this demo soft serve. I can put in a description, and then I have a choice of whether this is a source or a target. And this really depends uh, on, you know, not necessarily depends, but it dictates uh, what I can select from and also how I'm going to interact with the source and target. So if I leave it at source at the moment and take the drop down arrow, uh, we can see that uh, we have uh, the file. So I can read in CSV files, I can read in JSON format files. Um, we have file channel. Now this is what we use when I was talking about having a distributed architecture. I can have re replicate on premise, I can have replicate in my AWS cloud or my private cloud. And the way they communicate with each other is through this file channel uh, endpoint. Uh, we also support HP nonstop. Um, Hadoop, we can read from Hive uh, as a source, but only in a batch format. It doesn't have a transaction log that we read. Uh, there's IBM DB2 on just about every platform they've built it for. So whether it's 64-bit um, or 32-bit Linux, Unix, or Windows, there's iSeries, there's mainframe. Uh, there's IMS, there's Informix as well, uh, your standard SQL Server, MySQL, Oracle, Postgres, uh, RMS, SAP application that I was talking about earlier, Sybase. Uh, we can read from Salesforce uh, in a batch fashion, and I do think we're uh, close to coming out with CDC for Salesforce as well. Um, Teradata we can read from, and vSAM file structures as well. So you can see. The sources, as I talked about uh, in the presentation earlier, it's very structured. It's all about structured data. We can't deal with the unstructured world. Other tools do that really, really well. If there's something on the list that uh, you don't see, you know, you think we don't support, we have our own ODBC technology as well, which we've used in the past to connect to SAP HANA and uh, Exasol. So some of the newer technologies that are out there, but you know we haven't seen a strong commercial uh, drive for, um, we, we can still support those. Now, if I change the list to target, um, this is where you, you noticed on the left-hand side all my uh, icons change to the targets. But if I go and take the drop-down arrow, this is where it changes. Yes, we see the same standard uh, relational databases apart from DB2 in this list. Um, people typically want to get data out of DB2, replicate from DB2. They don't necessarily want to replicate into a DB2 instance. But uh, we see uh, data warehouses in here. So we have Actium Vector. We have HP Vertica. Uh, we have IBM Natiza. We see cloud technology here. So we see Amazon Redshift. We see Amazon S3, Google Cloud SQL. Uh, down the list, we've got Microsoft Azure. Uh, we see the standard file, um, Hadoop as a target, uh, Kafka as a target, um, so we'll be using looking at that. Uh, there's the Microsoft APS, their uh, big uh, SQL Server data warehouse stack. There's Azure, so Event Hubs, which is their version of Kafka, SQL Data Warehouse, Microsoft SQL Server, um, and if they're using Azure SQL Server, it's the Microsoft SQL Server is the standard connection for that. MongoDB is there as a target. That's our only NoSQL target. Uh, MySQL again, Oracle, Pivotal, Greenplum, and Hawk um, are supported as targets. Um, HANA is now no longer in preview. We can very much write to HANA. Um, Sybase, Sybase IQ, Snowflake, I mentioned earlier, the new uh, cloud technology. We can uh, support writing to Snowflake as a target. Teradata Aster and Teradata Database as well. So the target list very much encompasses all the other things besides a relational database, excluding DB2. So uh, if we take a look at one of the sources we're going to use, I'm going to use Oracle uh, because I have a nice demo script set up for that. To set that up, 
it's um, it's a local host for me, but it's a connection string is very standard. Um, it'll be the resource name or the uh, URL for your machine that's hosting Oracle or the service name and then the port. Um, the username, I'm going to use HR and a password. So if I click test connection, that tells me that I have a successful connection to Oracle working for me. Uh, if we have a look at Kafka as a target, that looks a little different uh, because it's not a um, uh, relational database, but uh, you know filling it out is is equally straightforward. So uh, actually, I want my Hortonworks Kafka. So there we are. There's my sandbox uh, address. There's the port. For security, um, I'm going to be using none. But if we have a look at what we support, um, we support certificate. Um, so using SSL with a certificate is supported. Uh, we support Kerberos whether that's um, on Windows or MIT type um, Kerberos, we support both, and standard username and password. Password, And if you're using the target uh, Kafka environment uh, for Hadoop, sorry, if the target Hadoop environment happens to be Hortonworks, we also support Knox authentication as well. Now, when we publish data, um, we can say, OK, I want all my data to go to one topic. That's fine. Uh, maybe that's a little messy on the consuming side. Uh, so what we're going to do in this task is we're going to separate, uh, have a separate topic for each table. So my broker is uh, set up so that it's uh, got a dynamic topic creation set to true. Um, and then the message key is going to be the, based on the schema and table name. Um, and then all I have to do is set up um, a keyword column, or a transformation rather, um, for the topic name and replicate will automatically create me separate topic topics based on the schema and table name and we'll have a look at that. And there's message properties for Kafka as well. So message properties come down to what format do I want to publish the data in? Do I want it to be in JSON uh, or do I want it to be in Avro? So we support Avro as a format um, in Kafka. Uh, I'm going to leave it as JSON, just so that we can read the output when we see it on the um, target. Um, and I'm going to publish schemas to a specific topic. Uh, so I know schemas doesn't exist anymore because I removed it. But if I click Browse, uh, hopefully this will come back. Yep. So there's my table schemas topic. So what we support. Um, is this uh, technology, it's in Confluent, and I, th I think it's part of the standard Apache Kafka uh, distribution, but it's the schema registry. So this enables um, a nice way to manage schema evolution, knowing which data set relates to the appropriate schema. So if I add a column, if I change a column, if I drop a column, uh, there's a uh, schema ID that's published in every message, and I can relate that to the schema ID in the schema registry. So that's uh, quite a handy feature of Kafka, and it is something that we support. So you can have, um, you know, nice correlation between changing data sets due to schema changes, and still be able to read them by going in and, and in linking the data set with the appropriate um, topic uh, for the schema or the schema structure which we send across as well. Uh, we do support in compression, so it's just snappy or gzip if you need to compress your data. Um, test connection, again, like a relational database, that will work because I got a uh, topic here. So I click Save, um, and that's the two endpoints covered uh, for a relational database and for Kafka. That's all I need to do. So I'm then ready to create a new task. Um, and this is what we call a replication task. So I click New Task, um, and let's call this Software, and I can give this a description. So Software, and it's then asking me about a replication profile. 99.9% um, of our customers use Replicate for unidirectional replication. That means I'm taking data from one place and I'm putting it somewhere else. Uh, we do support bidirectional replication. So instead of having source and target, I have data repository A, data repository B, and I want to keep the two data uh, sets in between them uh, the same and consistent. So if I have customers in Asia Pack and uh, customers in EMEA, um, actually, I want to 
get a combined merge view of that data in each location. So we do support bidirectional replication. As you can imagine, there are some caveats around that. So um, it's it's not a piece of cake. Uh, although we do make it straightforward, uh, there are some considerations that need to be taken into place. Um, then lastly, it's asking me about my task options. So this is uh, this is where we get a bit unique for uh, replication. Um, if we think about Oracle, they don't do the full load. They just do applying changes. Um, so if you want to have a complete data set on your um, Hadoop cluster that is uh, kept up to date, um, you have to copy all your data across there first, wait until your uh, source system is completely static, and then turn on replication. Um, so there's a, a couple of tools that operate in the same way uh, for them. Uh, change data capture is, is purely what they do. They just do change data capture. We do data synchronization with CDC. And the synchronization piece means we will take the full copy of your source, what you've selected to replicate, we'll apply that to the target, and then we'll keep that in sync. So you'll have a complete replication of the data on your target. The last option we have, which we'll look at when I do, if I get time, the Hadoop demo, is around storing changes. Um, which is what needs to be enabled for Hadoop so that we can actually figure out what we need to change in Hive. Um, but basically, that gives me a before and after snapshot of any updates or deletes. Um, obviously, with an insert, that's there's no previous record, but if I make a change to a customer and I change their phone number and their email address, um, then I get the before record of that customer and I get the after record of the change. Um, which is great for data warehousing. If someone wants uh, slowly changing dimension type 2 or they want history, we give them that. We deliver that at a record level. Um, so that makes that nice and straightforward. Uh, and some people just find it good to be able to understand, you know, how did a customer balance change? Was it in one hit or did they do it several times in a day? Um, so we'll have a look at that if we get time. So if, for Kafka, I'm just going to use full load and apply changes. I click OK. It then gives me a um, empty design palette. So the view has now changed uh, to my designer perspective. So on the top right hand side here, you can see the designer is in blue. We also have a monitoring perspective. Uh, again, you, you don't see Golden Gate or others also giving you monitoring capability. We give you that in the one tool as well. Um, so. It's really straightforward. I go to my sources. Uh, I go to my Oracle source. There's a little arrow on the side. I can click that, and it pumps it or populates the um, the source uh, target endpoint for me. If I go to my targets and look for my Hortonworks Kafka, uh, I can just click, and I can drag that onto the circle and let go. So it's as simple as that. The integration is now done. Uh, I know my Oracle source endpoint is working. I know my Kafka endpoint is working. So all I need to do now is configure the replication task. What is it that I want to replicate? So I have my connection to the Oracle source. So I can go here and select uh, tables or the schema that I want to replicate from. So I'll go to HR, click Search, and it returns a list of tables for me. Um, so I have all these tables here. And what I can do now is I can just click one table and say, OK, copy that across for me. Um, I can select all of them. And that means I'm just selecting this list of tables. However, if I know that this uh, list of tables in this schema changes, maybe once every three or four months, um, there's a change request that goes through and they add a table or they change a table. Maybe they even drop a table. Um, rather than have to come back in, stop my task, copy that change, then restart my task, Replicate will do it for me. So I can use this wildcard pattern here to say, um, load everything in the HR schema. If a new table is added to the HR schema, it will automatically copy that across for me. I don't need to come here and change anything. So I can click OK, and I can see the uh, pattern here. If I look at my full table list, there I can see the current list of tables uh, that will be replicated. 
Now that's, um, if, if all I wanted to do, if all your customer was asking for was I just need a copy of these tables from A to B and I want them to be transactionally consistent between source and target, you're done. You can now go here and click the run button at the top. However, um, if they say, well actually, you know what, um, it's going to Kafka in this instance, uh, instead of having eight tables, I've got 800 tables or maybe 1200 tables. I don't want to have to set up an individual topic for each one. The development team, the consumers, they do want a separate topic, but my God, it's going to be a pain in the backside. So I can use a global transformation to do what I mentioned earlier. Um, so I can say, create a new transformation. Uh, so I can call this Kafka uh, topic. Now, some of the transformations uh, that we support, I can rename a schema. So I can globally, instead of having all the data applied to HR, dot whatever the table names are on a target, I could perhaps rename it as human resources because it's a little easier to understand on a target. Um, maybe I'm getting some tables out of SAP and the tables don't make sense. So I can give them a general rename. If they fit a certain pattern, uh, I can rename tables. I can rename columns. I can add a column, which is what I'm going to do in this instance. Um, I can drop columns or I can convert known data types that I, I know are going to give me issues on the target. So I can globally convert a data type. So I click Next. Now that I've selected Add Column, uh, yes, I want to apply this to everything that I'm copying. And the column name, now this is where I have to use uh, this keyword dollar topic. Dollar topic means I'm not actually going to add a column to the target. I could add other columns, like I could add a replication timestamp. I could add uh, a uh, schema and table name so that I've got some lineage information at the data level, those sorts of things. Uh, but dollar topic means it's not going to add a new column, um, but it's going to create a new topic for me. What do I want that topic to look like? So I go into my expression builder here, and I'm going to use the metadata of the tables to build my topics. So I'm going to use the schema, so I click on the arrow, and uh, then I'm going to uh, put in place, so I'll use an append, and what I'll do is I'll put in place an underscore in between the schema, and uh, then I'll actually append the table name. Uh, so I can test this, uh, so if I have the word schema and the word table, what will my actual topic, uh, topic name look like? It will look like schema underscore table. So there's a, a good uh, naming convention that I can put in place here globally without having to apply this to a thousand plus tables. So that's a, just a simple overview of, of a global transformation. Uh, we're not limited to that either. Um, so if I go into the employees table, um, you can see on the left hand side here I get some general information, it tells me there's 107 records there. If I need to map it to an existing table and schema, I can do that. So if I had human resources um, employees there already, uh, then I can put in human resources and I can leave the table blank uh, because it's the same name. But if it was a different table name, uh, obviously I could uh, also stipulate that. Uh, I can filter data. So if I've got uh, you know 20 years of employee data, uh, do you know what? I don't need all of that. I can go in, uh, I can select higher date. Do I want to do an include or an exclude? Well, I only want to include um, you know values that are greater than or equal to, uh, and let's say, the first of the first 2012. So I'll get the last five years of higher date information about my employees. So I can put in filters. Um, now I filtered then on a column within the data. Uh, I could also filter by um, an action. So I could filter out deletes. If I didn't want deletes actually occurring, I could filter them out or I could code them as a soft delete. So rather than actually performing the delete, I could mark the record as deleted from the target. Um, I could filter out uh, actions by a particular user. So if I knew um, the application name did all the actual uh, changes, but overnight there was a system name that came on board and did some mass purging, and I didn't want to lose that, I could filter out uh, by the user and so on. 
So the other option we have is we can do some data transformation. And again, I'll, I'll go back to what I said about Gartner. Even though we sit as a challenger on the data integration uh, magic quadrant, we are not an ETL tool. But what we can do in flight with data is we can augment, enrich, uh, or you know remove uh, data. So we've worked with some customers that have um, you know 600 plus columns, and in fact uh, today we learned that there's another customer that's got 1,600 uh, columns in a couple of their tables. How they got that big, I, I don't know. I'd hate to be dealing with something that had 1,600 columns. But uh, let's say the business said, yeah, you know what, we need that information. Really, do you need all 1,600 columns, or are there 20 or 30 that you really need? Um, so you can mass deselect and go through and say, yeah, we just want uh, the job date, the hire date, and the employee ID. Uh, whoops, you know, those individual columns, and, and I'm happy with that. that. That gives me the information I need. Um, but in this case, we'll say we want all of them. But in my target, you know, first name and last name isn't isn't really helpful uh, because it may appear disjointed. The countries where these first names and the last names come from, if it's China, if it's uh, the Middle East, you know, th that may be a bit difficult for me to actually understand what's the first and last name. So let's add a, a new column, and we can call this full name. Uh, I'll leave it as a string, but if I wanted to, I can choose other uh, data types here, such as date time, such as integer. Uh, the, th this is our own internal uh, format for data types, and we map the data types between the source and target for you, so you don't have to think about that. What do I want to put in the full name? Uh, well, again, really, really simple. Um, I'll just take their uh, last name, if I can find it. And I'll uh, do an append again, as I did with the topic name, and I'll put in a comma and a space, and then I'll append uh, the first name. And again, I can test this. So, blogs, Joe, what will that look like? It will come out as blogs, comma, space, Joe. And if everyone knows that it's the format of the surname and then the first name, uh, then they understand what exactly they're looking at when they look at someone's full name. So I've got a transformation there. I've got a full name. I've, re I, you know, I can, well, I have removed the first and last name. So I, this is now different to the um, to the original data, and subsequently it tells me that all these other columns, or sorry, tables, uh, they're not changed, but my employees' data that's changed. So I, if someone asks or wants to know why the data they're seeing on their target isn't a true reflection of what it is on the source, they can come in here and they can see that. Um, but we've explored the capabilities. We can see what we can do. Um, so let's save this. Uh, let's just make sure I've still got a connection to Kafka. So you can see the only um, topic I've got there at the moment is table schemas, and I selected that so that my um, schemas for my tables uh, will be published to that in JSON format. So now let's run. So I just click Start Processing. And it's now doing synchronization between the source tables and the transaction log and making sure there's no open transactions in the transaction log. And when it sees it's ready, it jumps into the monitoring uh, perspective. So don't take this as a reflection of the performance, because my VM is, is pretty well maxed out at the moment, running two different virtual machines. Uh, but we can see it's now uh, loading data from my source system to Kafka. Um, so it's done the employees. It's done everything now. Um, so it's completed. Um, so this is the full load uh, aspect. So in the top left, um, we can see I'm looking at full load. And it's essentially now waiting for changes. So if I click on change processing, again, I've got the table list. And you can see that there's been no activity. There's been no inserts, no updates, no deletes. And I've had no DDL changes. So the full load is being completed. OK, so if I bring up Kafka now, if I refresh my topics view, there are all my topics. So you can see that I've actually got them in the uh, format of HR underscore countries, HR underscore department. So that is my schema underscore, and there's my table name.
So I created all my topics without actually having to ask someone to create the topics for me, uh, replicated that for me. And let's have a look at uh, the table schemas. Um, so if I go to the data, click run, so it is not, so I've got it in a byte array, sorry, so let me change that to string and change that to string, click update, go back to data, replay, okay, and change the view to JSON, okay, um, I'm not sure what what you're seeing, what type of screen you're seeing this on. Um, my apologies if it's if it's very difficult to read. Um, but basically, we've got here um, eight or nine messages. Each of these um, reflect the schema for the data that we uh, replicated. So I've got a, a message schema ID at the top here. So this particular ID relates to any data that I get for HR employees. So this is the schema for my HR employees um, table from the target. So it tells me um, the employee ID, so it's a column definition, um, it's ordinal, it's the first position, it's an integer of 4, uh, in 4 its length is 10, it has a position of 0. Um, the next one is email, it's a string, it's 26. So it gives me all the column definition information I need as part of that um, schema information. So it gives me all of this information, which is great, and then it tells me uh, information about the data schema across the bottom, and, and that just scrolls across a long way. So this is the schema information. Uh, okay, let's have a look at the HR uh, person, HR table. Uh, I change that again to string and change that to string, update that, have a look at the data, uh, replay that, have a look at the data and view that as JSON and here we go. So we can see I've got an employee ID 102, here's the email, here's their phone number, their hire date, their job ID, so on and so on. So. And you can see the operation here. Um, it's a refresh, so this means it's been a full load of data. Um, so all of these will be um, full loads because there's been no changes come through. So let's see what happens when we do a change. So if I go back uh, to replicate, um, I have something of a handy tool that I use uh, just so that I can do changes without having to bring up a DOS prompt and write in SQL statements. So let's change the view to SQL, uh, sorry, to change processing. Uh, bring up my CDC testing and let's do some changes. Um, so let's see if anything changes here. I've dropped 50 rows. Uh, I can delete 50 regions. Uh, I can insert 100 regions. Uh, I can give people a pay rise so I can increase their salary a couple of times. Uh, I can add a column to the regions, I could drop a column from the regions, um, and I can create a new table. So let's create the contractor table, because if you remember, I said, give me this um, functionality to be able to replicate as it is now, or any new tables. Uh, so if you can see here, countries is at the top. Uh, so if I add a new table called contractor, um, I should get uh, a new contractor table being applied to my list at the bottom here uh, once that updates. Uh, let's give it, well actually let's do some decreased salaries. So there's the contractor table that's appeared and we can see that the changes have gone through, not, not in a near real time because my, um, my, my VM is <laughs> running under duress, uh, rather my laptop is. Um, so I can, from a graph, I can instantly see I've had some updates, I've had some DDL changes, some deletes and some inserts, and down the bottom I can actually see at a granular level I had 535 updates to my employees table. Um, there's a contractor table, it's just a DDL change, so that's a new table, um, and the regions has had 150 applied, 50 of which were deletes and 100 of which were inserts. So let's go back to Kafka. Um, so if I refresh my topics, I should see a new topic here for HR contractor. So refresh, or rather refresh here, 
thank you. It doesn't want to display that. Fantastic. So maybe that didn't. Uh, ah, there's been no data for it yet. So if I have a look here, you can see, right, I have the schema for it. Um, so let's have a look. So here is HR contractor. Um, it's a fairly basic definition, but there's the new schema. All I did was generate a new schema. Um, it was only going to generate a new topic here if it was going to publish data, and I didn't publish any data. Um, but here is the definition for the new schema. So when data comes along, it has the relevant uh, schema ID to correlate the data with. Um, so let's have a look at the employees table. And if I go back to the properties, um, I think I started out with 107 records um, delivered to the topic. My apologies, I should have shown you at the start, but it was just a standard uh, HR record of 107. Uh, if I go back to the full load view, um, yeah, so the HR started out at 107. Uh, I think we applied some changes. So total applied for employees was 535, so I should see 640-ish. So if I refresh, yep, 642 uh, messages on there now. So it's the original 107 plus all the changes. So let's have a look at those. And uh, rather than look at the oldest, uh, let's have a look at some of the newest records and refresh. And if I have a look at the one at the top, and we can see it's giving me a message ID that this correlates to. Um, and I can see I've got a salary change. So, and here's my before data. So this, uh, if we look at the bottom, uh, where we've got the header information, I can see the operation was an update. Um, here's the timestamp for that update. And I have, big, now, this isn't because of uh, Kafka or Replicate. We haven't captured every record or every column because the logging level on my Oracle system is set to uh, minimal logging. So what it's picking up are the key fields and uh, the data that has changed. So this is where we're seeing in the before uh, section here, the salary was 24,068, and afterwards it's 24,069. So I'm not really generous at my pay rises. Um, they won't be very happy this Christmas, but at least I accurately caught the uh, the changes of their salary. So for historical purposes, if he complains, uh, he's got a case to make by saying, you know, my salary before was 24,068, and I can clearly say that, see that, and say, yeah, you're right. I should have given you a two pound pay rise instead of one. Um, but this is how we publish data to, to Kafka. This is, um, you, you get the schema ID, so you can, the message schema ID is at the top here, so you know how you're correlating this data set with the topic, the appropriate topic. Um, so again, uh, we probably should see a different topic for regions, and I should see a different schema ID for the regions data. Um, but I'm not going to go into that because it'll take me a while to sift through all these records and, and find it. So any, any questions? I'll open that up to, to questions for the time being. No questions. Have I completely run out of time?